So thank you everyone for joining us today for this Australian Institute of Criminology seminar. My name is Anthony Morgan and I'm the research manager for the AIC Serious and Organised Crime Research Laboratory. I'm here with my colleague Hayley Boxall, who leads our research into family and domestic violence. Today, we are excited to announce the launch of our new paper, Policing Repeat Domestic Violence, Would Focus Deterrence Work in Australia? Along with Hayley, this paper was co-authored with Dr Christopher Dowling and Dr Rick Brown, the Deputy Director of the AIC. This paper is available now for free download from the AIC's website. This is the culmination of three years of research by the AIC into the characteristics of domestic violence offenders, patterns and risk factors for repeat offending, and the efficacy of criminal justice responses. I'd like to acknowledge the many AIC staff who have been involved in the different research projects undertaken as part of this work. This is an important and challenging issue. We all know the figure from the AIC's National Homicide Monitoring Program of one woman being killed every week and one man killed every 30 days by an intimate partner. Recently, we've been shocked by the tragic high-profile murder of Hannah Clark and her three small children. We also know that police respond to hundreds of domestic violence incidents every day, often involving repeat offenders. And with the exception of homicide, we've seen very little evidence of the prevalence of domestic violence having decreased in recent years. And so we at the AIC are therefore passionate about finding ways to improve the criminal justice response to domestic violence to reduce the harm to victims. So how did we arrive at Focus Deterrence? I want to briefly describe the journey we took to get to this point before I talk about the Focus Deterrence model. The AIC has a long history in family violence research, but in 2016 our Advisory Council identified improving criminal justice responses to family and domestic violence as one of our then four research priorities. Given the enormous body of work underway in this space, led by other institutes including ANRAS, we chose to focus our effort on policing strategies. More importantly, we adopted a crime science approach which meant focusing on domestic violence events and incidents in a way that would directly inform prevention strategies. We also drew upon the extensive repeat victimisation literature, which has been extremely influential in determining how best to respond to other crime types, but has a limited footprint in domestic violence. In 2016-17, we undertook our first studies. Reanalyzing police data, we identified trends in repeat violence that were remarkably consistent with the broader repeat victimisation literature. Our review of more than 300 policing, uh, studies into policing and responses to domestic violence demonstrated how important police are at improving the response to victims and preventing further violence, but that there was also room for improvement. In 2018, we were fortunate to participate in a roundtable with David Kennedy, who was responsible for developing the focus deterrence approach and is the leader of the National Network for Safe Communities at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Although he only spoke briefly about domestic violence, he put forth a compelling argument for focused deterrence approaches as a model to reduce uh, violence. On the back of this, we co-hosted two of his team, Rachel Teacher and Kyle Lott, with Garner Clancy from the University of Sydney. And we held a number of seminars in Sydney and Canberra to explore the intimate partner violence intervention, the domestic violence adaption, adaptation of the focused deterrence approach in more detail. This provided us with an opportunity to explore the applicability of the model to the Australian context with local stakeholders. And it was on the basis of this experience and our family, violence, family and domestic violence research more broadly that we prepared the paper that we're releasing today. So what is focused deterrence? In short, it's a police-led response, a police-led intervention that aims to influence the behaviour of in individuals through the strategic application, application of enforcement and social services. It began in 1995 in Boston with the well-known, now well-known Operation Ceasefire, which combined problem-oriented policing with collaboration between law enforcement and community stakeholders to reduce gang violence in the city. It quite famously resulted in a 60% reduction in youth homicide. The model is basically a classic problem solving approach and many of the program components are consistent with many other approaches, not just domestic violence. It begins with identifying a specific crime problem in a specific location involving specific individuals. An interagency group comprising the main stakeholders who are required to respond on the law enforcement and social services side 
are, are brought together as an interagency group. There is detailed analysis of data on offenders to identify patterns of repeat offending and victimisation to, and to identify chronic offenders and the range of criminal activity that those individuals may be involved in. This is used to inform the development of an offender hierarchy that becomes the basis for the entire intervention. There is a focus on improving both victim and offender access to support services, making services available uh, and ensuring there are clear referral pathways for individuals to be referred to those services. But it's this point where the model starts to diverge from some of our more traditional approaches. First of all, it involves communicating deliberately and directly with offenders about the risk and consequences of further criminal activity uh, and the community norms that oppose violence. This is underpinned by a procedurally just approach which relies on um, being fair and respectful, um, which has been shown to be incredibly influential in, in improving offender compliance and also changing behaviour. Importantly, the, the focus is on getting deterrence messages right. If you tell offenders that there are consequences associated with their behaviour, if they continue to offend, then those consequences must be, uh, must be imposed. And action must be taken against those offenders quickly and consistently with the messaging that's been provided. At the same time, those offenders are offered support to change their behaviour. So if they choose to continue to offend, then obviously the sanctions that are a part of the model will be imposed. But if they're willing and ready to change their behaviour, then available support is offered to help facilitate that. Another important component of the focused deterrence approach is that the community voice is mobilised and community capacity improved to help oppose violence. So it's all about building community capacity to help prevent uh, further violence in that, that affects that community. This might be in the messaging that's directed to individuals, both in written and face-to-face and -face communication. And it's also an important part of the, the component of focus deterrence that's quite well known, which is the call-in, where all of the stakeholders involved in the program and community representatives are brought together to confront the offender about their behaviour and to tell them that, that behaviour is no longer going to be accepted uh, and action will be taken and but also support is being offered. And finally, uh, the focus deterrence approach involves what's known as pulling levers, which, when the offender's behaviour continues uh, and they continue to offend and, 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 and repeat, commit further acts of violence, then law enforcement will draw upon the full suite of legal actions to try and stop the violence. This might be related to the violence that is, or the, the crime that is the focus of the intervention, or it might be arranged, related to any of the criminal activity that, that individual might be involved in. This is a model that's been developed in response to different crime problems. This includes group violence, often involving gun violence, reducing offending by chronic repeat offenders, drug market interventions, and interventions to reduce violence in prisons. And although it originated in the United States, focused deterrence has also now been delivered in multiple countries, as well as being deployed in numerous states in the US, including both small and large cities. The National Network for Safe, Safe Communities has supported its delivery in Scotland, specifically Glasgow to reduce knife crime, Mexico and most recently Malmo and Sweden, as well as several other countries. The NNSC, led by David Kennedy, has performed a vital role in helping to support communities de design and deliver locally tailored interventions that are consistent with the focused deterrence model. As well as being theoretically robust, there is a large body of evidence that shows focused deterrence is an effective approach to preventing violent crime. This is a well-studied intervention. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis of rigorous evaluations of focused deterrence strategies observed noteworthy crime reduction effects in 19 of 24 studies that were included in the review. The authors of that review argued that it should be part of a portfolio of crime reduction strategies employed by policymakers and practitioners. This evidence base invite, in, inspired Harvard scholar uh, Thomas App, who previously published a meta-review of what works in reducing community violence, to write in his book that nothing works as well as to reduce urban violence as focused deterrence. It does not work perfectly, it does not work every time, but it works better on average than anything else out there. But of course so far I've been talking about focused deterrence in, in response to other forms of violence, not domestic violence. Fifteen years ago, David Kennedy wrote an article entitled Rethinking Law Enforcement Strategies to Prevent Domestic Violence, 
In this article, he observed that many of the patterns of offending that characterised other forms of violence were present in domestic violence, even if the underlying causes of that violence were quite different. He cited studies that showed most domestic violence offenders were not specialist offenders, contrary to popular belief, and they committed other types of crime unrelated to domestic violence, that many domestic violence offenders were repeat offenders, and that there was a small group of particularly chronic offenders. And on the back of this, he proposed adap adapting the focus deterrence model to domestic violence. It took some time for this vision to be realised, with the intimate partner violence intervention first implemented in North Carolina in 2012. Many of the core elements of the focus deterrence approach remain central to the intimate partner violence intervention. First, the IPVI prioritises the most at-risk vi victims and dangerous offenders. Importantly though, it delivers a response to all offenders and victims. This is, as I will talk about, underpinned by what is known as the offender hierarchy. Second, there is an emphasis on offender accountability and a focus on changing the behaviour of the offender. The intent is to shift the burden for preventing violence away from the victim. This is not about being tough on crime. There is an emphasis on enhancing legitimacy and procedural justice. Offenders are more responsive when law enforcement are fair and respectful. This is necessary to get deterrence right. Law enforcement need to communicate the consequences of further violence and to keep those promises. And for deterrence to work, it's necessary to, account, to counter the experiential effect of previous contact with the criminal justice system, where perhaps domestic violence hasn't been responded in the way um, that it might be responded or, as part of this model. And at the same time, offenders who want to change are offered the necessary support services, much like the focused deterrence approach generally. Enforcement is used strategically, and it's about getting the right dose of law enforcement and legal sanctions to change the behaviour and increasing that dose as the risk to the victim increases. This includes the pulling levers component which I described earlier. When the risk to the victim reaches a certain point, then law enforcement has to take any legal action available to them to prevent the victim from further harm. Third, focused deterrence involves matching the right support and protection to each victim through parallel outreach. As the response to offender intensifies, so does the response to victims. Victims receive the same information as offenders, either before or at the same time as offenders, so they know exactly what is happening. This is vital to building trust. And finally, it involves uh, community norms opposing the violence. This can occur in written notifications, direct face-to-face -face communication, or as part of the call-in that I described before. At the heart of this strategy is the offender hierarchy, which is based on detailed analysis of local patterns of offending. This will not look the same in every community. This organises offenders according to their risk of repeat offending and the harm to victims. Offenders are ranked from level D, which is reserved for first time incidents, probably not involving violent or serious harm, and which do not result in the offender being arrested, through to level A, which includes chronic repeat offenders who have been unresponsive to previous interventions. This is different to more traditional responses, which is tended to split offenders into those not identified as high risk and a small group of high risk offenders, the latter receiving high intensity of responses. This offender hierarchy is used as the basis of the parallel graduated response to both offenders and victims. As offenders move up the hierarchy from level D, responses to both victims and offenders become increasingly intensive. So for a level D offender involving, involved in an incident that did not result in arrest, the response might be to communicate the consequences of further violence and the fact that the community is treating domestic violence as a serious priority. Similar messaging is directed to the victim, along with offers to provide assistance. And of course, at the opposite end of the spectrum, the response to level A offenders is to draw upon all and any legal sanctions available to stop the offending. Victims are provided with on-scene support and assistance, and all available services are made available to the victim to protect them from further harm. Of course, the actual interventions delivered need to be developed locally, informed by local analysis, and agreed by the different partners involved in the strategy. As I mentioned, the IPVI was implemented in High Point, North Carolina, and it has been evaluated, although it's uh, not been evaluated as extensively as the, the response in other domains. The impact on intimate partner homicides in High Point is often discussed, although it's important to note that the fall, indeed, indeed near eradication of intimate partner homicide in that community, coincides with the introduction of focus deterrence models for other forms of violence. However, there are results specific to the IPVI that are very promising. A recent study by Stacey Seacrest and John Wow found that the introduction of the IPVI coincided with a 20% reduction in calls for service for domestic violence 
a 20% reduction in arrests for domestic violence and a 20 percentage point reduction in the proportion of domestic violence incidents that involved violence from around two thirds to less than half. In other words, it had a significant impact on the severity of violence experienced by victims in that community. And these results led to the US Office on Violence Against Women to provide funding to replicate the high point model in other locations. The question is then, would this work in Australia? And it's at this point I pass over to my colleague, Hallie Boxall, to describe the arguments in favour of trialling focused deterrence and the issues that need to be considered and resolved before any trial takes place. Okay, so over the past few years, the AIC has conducted a huge body of research which has looked at domestic violence offending and reoffending in Australia. We really wanted to understand who is coming into contact with the police, what are the nature of those incidents, and what is the nature of the patterns of reoffending that are being detected by the police. So this is a bit of a toot toot because we've done so much work, but these are multiple studies that have been undertaken using different data sources from different states and territories. So predominantly we've done systematic reviews, the analysis of administrative data sets maintained by police officers who are responding to domestic violence incidents and also police narratives. So police narratives are those, I guess, text-based descriptions that police officers responding to domestic violence incidents provide as a means of supporting investigations and things like that. So, on the back of this evidence, what do we know about domestic violence reoffending patterns that would suggest that it would actually be that focused deterrence would be an appropriate response to this cohort of offenders? So the AIC conducted a systematic review of all Australian evidence from 1990 to 2018, really to understand what is the nature of Australian offenders who are coming into contact with the police for domestic violence offending. And what we found from this review of 39 studies is that repeat offending is really, really common. So across a number of studies, what we can broadly kind of say is that one in two domestic violence offenders will come back into contact with the police within about five years. However, risk of reoffending is not constant between individuals, across communities or even over time. What we know is that risk of reoffending is concentrated. So on one end of the spectrum, we know that a small proportion of domestic violence offenders are accounting for a large amount of offences that are reported to the police and also a disproportionate amount of harm. So some analysis that was done in the Northern Territory, for example, found that 8% of offenders were responsible for 27% of the harm associated with domestic violence offending. And some analysis done in Victoria found that 7% of offenders were responsible for 31% of incidents that were coming to the attention of the police. So there is a cohort of domestic violence offenders who are accounting for a large amount of the domestic violence harm and offences that are coming to our attention. But not only that, we know that risk of reoffending is concentrated within particular communities. So some analysis done in Queensland identified that communities characterised by lower levels of socioeconomic status were accounting for a disproportionate number of calls for service. And there's also some emerging evidence about particular communities, higher um, socioeconomic communities being associated with particular forms of domestic violence, particularly coercive controlling behaviours. However, some, a number of studies that the AIC has done has also identified that risk of reoffending is not even constant over time. So I said that one in two domestic violence offenders will come back into contact with the police within about five years. Well, actually, that's going to, it's most likely going to happen much sooner than that. So it's going to happen in the days and weeks and months following a domestic violence report to the police. So some analysis that we did using Tasmanian Victorian data found that one in four domestic violence offenders will come back into contact with the police within six months. However, what we really do know is that risk of reoffending is concentrated around the four week mark. So if it's going to happen, it is likely to happen very quickly. And if we can carry offend victim and survivors through that initial high risk period, their likelihood of being um, experiencing further violence starts to tail off. So again, what we're kind of seeing is that there is a real need to implement targeted interventions very quickly in the aftermath of a domestic violence incident. Risk of reoffending is also dynamic. So what happens in the days, weeks and months following a domestic violence incident reported to the police has implications for subsequent reoffending patterns. So, um, so for what example, one a couple of studies that we have done has identified that risk of repeat domestic violence offending 
is cumulative. So while only 14% of domestic violence offenders re-offend within 60 days of that cohort, 28% go on to re-offend again within 60 days, and then 43% re-offend within another 60 day period. So what this really does say is that by the time the police turn up to a house three times within a 60 day period, the likely, well, a 120 day period, the likelihood that they will turn up again is pretty much the flip of a coin. So what we're seeing here is the escalation of a pattern of re-offending that is obviously not being deterred by whatever criminal justice responses are being put into place for that cohort of offenders. I mean, something to note is that this, this only accounts for a very small proportion of domestic violence offenders. So of the sample that we had, this is about 2%. So really, this really demonstrates that we need to be throwing uh, we need to have a graduated intervention response for a very small cohort of domestic violence offenders who are not being deterred by the business as usual kind of model. In terms of understanding that risk of reoffending is dynamic as well, um, what we do know is that the timing of the first reoffence really does matter in terms of, I guess, dictating what happens in terms of subsequent reoffending. So the less time it takes you to reoffend once, the more likely you are to reoffend again very quickly and also reoffend multiple times. So this really does identify the importance of interrupting a pattern of behaviour. So preventing one incident can be really important for preventing the reoccurrence of these behaviours in the longer term. So what though all those that research kind of highlights is that we have a cohort of very motivated offenders who are likely to reoffend in the days, weeks and months following a contact with, with the police and are potentially not being deterred by traditional criminal justice responses or at least the traditional service delivery model through which we are, I guess, um, implementing these responses, which really does kind of pick up on the, the potential benefits of focus deterrence, which I'll talk about in a little minute. So what else do we know about domestic violence offenders which potentially provides evidence or support for the use of focused deterrence? So what we do know is that domestic violence offenders who come into contact with the police are very likely to be generalist offenders. So what is a generalist offender? It's a criminological term that we use to really describe offenders who are involved in multiple different forms of offending behaviour. So a generalist may be someone who's involved in property offending, maybe breaching orders, traffic offences and violent offences. Whereas a specialist is someone who really only focuses their offending behaviours on one particular offending type, if that's domestic violence or it could be fraud, so on and so forth. So what we have noted is that the vast majority of domestic violence offenders who come into contact with the criminal justice system are generalist offenders. And not only that, domestic violence offenders are likely to be involved in multiple other offending behaviours, so traffic offences, breach offences and the like. So this is some analysis that we did using 10 years worth of New South Wales police data um, taken from Boxer. And what we identify is that specialisation is very, very small. And domestic violence offenders are involved in multiple forms of offending behaviour, even relative to other violent offenders and non-violent offenders. So why is this important from the point of view of focused deterrence responses? Well, it's what Anthony was talking about in terms of pulling levers. And when you're dealing with a very highly motivated domestic violence offender who is not being deterred by traditional criminal justice responses, there needs to be other mechanisms through which we can pull levers to bring about um, improved safety for victims and survivors and the community. And if someone is involved in other offending behaviours, that provides opportunities to pull levers. So if we can't prosecute someone for a domestic violence offence for whatever of the litany of reasons that are barriers for prosecuting these cases, we might be able to get them on a traffic offence or a breach offence or something like that. So this just really highlights the nature of the type of offender who are coming into contact with the police and the potential you of a focused deterrence model. So what all of our research has kind of come to the point of really saying is that there is a really obvious need for timely targeted and graduated responses. So timely in the sense that we need to be able to cocoon high risk victims during high risk periods of time. And that is typically from our research, the days, weeks and months following a contact with the police. 
we also need to be targeted. So we need to be able to focus our efforts on people, offenders, victims and survivors who we identify as being high risk for experiencing subsequent harm and serious harm. And that really does, um, that really ties in with what we identify with the 2% being involved in escalating, um, escalating levels of behaviour. We need to be able to identify them and target a lot of resources at that cohort of very highly motivated offenders. And graduated responses. We need to be able to match the intervention with the escalating level of risk that might be, I guess, situated around a dyad, so a victim and survivor and offender, for a discrete period of time. So for that 2% escalated risk, um, cumulative risk group that I identified, we need to be able to follow that offender. So if the first intervention didn't work, what else are we going to do the next time they come into contact with the police and then the next time? Because I think that is just evidence that these are people who are not being deterred by what we're putting in place. So we need to have something that is graduated. Happily, when domestic violence is reported to the police, the police can influence the likelihood of whether further violence is going to occur and also victim satisfaction outcomes and well-being and also criminal justice outcomes. And there's been a huge amount of work being done by the police, particularly over the last 10 years, in terms of improving how they respond to domestic violence. However, <clears throat> I think we can all kind of agree that traditional criminal justice sanctions do not prevent domestic violence in all circumstances. So the police have a huge number of tools in their arsenal that they can put in place to try and prevent the recurrence of domestic violence. And yet reoffending is so common amongst this cohort. What this really does highlight is that no one criminal justice intervention is going to be effective in all circumstances. So let's talk about protection orders as a particular, um, I guess, example of this. So protection orders is one of the most commonly implemented interventions for domestic violence. And this is increasingly so in recent years because in many states and territories now, the police are able to apply for protection orders on behalf of victim survivors without the involvement of victim survivors. And what we do know is that the numbers of protection orders that are being applied for are skyrocketing in Australia. However, we did some a systematic review to look at the actual efficacy of protection orders. And what we identified is that happily, protection orders are associated with a small but significant reduction in severe domestic violence. So domestic violence, severe is a bit of a loaded term, but we're talking about um, things like uh, sexual abuse, um, choking injuries, things like that. So it's very good at preventing the escalation of behaviours and severe domestic violence. However, there are caveats associated with the, um, I guess, the efficacy of protection orders. Most importantly, that it is most likely to be effective in situations where the victim survivor and the offender do not have ongoing reasons for contact with one another. So if they've got kids together, if they've got a business together, if they've got shared family kind of commitments where are, they are likely to come into contact with each other, there is likely to be further violence. And what we do know is that in many relationships that are abusive, children are present. And even when we put in parenting orders and um, handover arrangements and things like that, violence can reoccur. So we have a huge section of the population where protection orders are potentially not going to be very effective for. And we also know that these orders are less effective for offenders with a history of crime, violence and mental health issues. The mental health issues one is an interesting one because protection orders are very much based on the idea of rational decision making. I won't do this because then I could be arrested, prosecuted, charged, whatever. So the risks associated with the behaviour are too high. However, someone with diminished decision making capacity may not be as deterred by these types of by these types of risks. And also when we think about domestic violence as being potentially very predatory behaviours, sometimes the perceived benefit of terrorising, harassing, intimidating their partner will outweigh any kind of criminal justice outcome. So what this really does say is that we do have a huge body of evidence which says that the nature of the domestic violence offenders who are coming into contact with the police and the nature of their reoffending patterns of behaviour suggests that focused deterrence would actually be very appropriate for this cohort. 
However, that's not to say that there aren't any potential issues that we need to consider when we're implementing a model like this. Any kind of domestic, any innovative domestic violence response requires some pretty careful thinking through and some experts to be in a room to hash some of this stuff out. So some of the potential issues that we have identified include the relevance of a model developed in the US, balancing certainty with complexity, the perceptions of police amongst highest risk populations, tension around the use of incarceration, the applicability of coercive controlling behaviours with a model like this, and integration with other responses. So I just want to pick up on a couple of these just to unpick them a little bit more. So balancing certainty with complexity. What we're dealing with with focused deterrence, it basically, it's a recidivism model. So if you re-offend, the level of intervention that comes into play escalates. However, how does that work in concordance with desistance processes? Desistance is the longer term processes through which an offender stops their offending behaviours and may involve a transition to a non-criminal identity and so on and so forth. So on the certainty side of things, we do have some risk assessment tools which have been proven to be pretty okay in terms of helping us to identify who is likely to re-offend. So this is based on some research that Anthony and Chris Dowling did using ACT policing data, which looked at the factors that were associated with predicting, uh, which were associated with prevalence of reoffending within six months of a contact with the police. And the tool that they identified, the revised FV rat, zero, had a 0 0.73 efficacy rate. So it was actually a really quite a good tool for them to use. However, this is a 10 item empirically derived tool. It's only um, informed really by information provided by the police, will provide it to the police at time of at, um, turning up to an incident. It doesn't actually tell us anything about escalating risk as well. And I think that's something that we need to be really mindful of with a recidivism style model, which is what the focus deterrence model is, is that they're looking at prevalence of reoffending. Where does risk of escalation kind of fit in with that? So. We have the complexity associated with what about escalating behaviours, what about desistance processes, how do we merge that within a focused deterrent star model. This isn't anything that can't be, I guess, alleviated or nutted out, but it is just something that we need to kind of think about. And the way that the FV rat did that with ACT policing is that even though they had these 10, item, 10 items that all police have to complete to identify who is high risk of prevalence of reoffending. They also have high risk flags, which are four high risk flags that they have to complete, which is correlated with perceived risk of escalating behaviours. So the tool kind of does both, which is just a nice example of how we balance certainty and complexity. So the other one I wanted to talk a little bit about was uh, responding to coercive controlling behaviours. So my experience from analysing police data from the last 10 years is that the police are increasingly being asked to respond to incidents involving non-physical forms of violence, so stalking, emotional, verbal abuse, financial abuse and things of that nature, which is really encouraging to see that it isn't just the physical violence side of things that are being reported to the police. However, because focus deterrence is a police-led model and the nature of the incidents that do come to the attention of the police are more likely to be physical violence, there is a real question of, well, how do we embed understandings of coercive controlling behaviours within a focus deterrence model? This isn't anything that can't be addressed because I think that the beauty of a community-led multiple system approach like focus deterrence is that there are people in the room who are able to identify and build coercive controlling understanding within the response. I mean, one option is, is that you include coercive controlling behaviours as an exacerbating factor or a risk factor for escalation, but the focus deterrence model is not inconsistent with coercive controlling behaviours. It is just something that has to be better built into it considering that this is a police-led model. The final thing to really talk about is the integration of focus deterrence with other responses. So most of our research has focused on the tertiary end of things. So looking at how we can improve responses to victims, survivors and offenders who have come to the attention of the police. So the behaviours have already started. This response is not supposed to be for everyone. This is dealing with a very particular problem that the police are responding to. This sits in concert with all of the other work that is currently going on in terms of the primary prevention work and the early intervention work. This is really just dealing with the pointy end of the spectrum.
So at the end of all this, we feel at the ARC that there is sufficient evidence to trial focused deterrence and a pulling levers approach to reducing domestic violence reoffending in an Australian pilot site. This site and the program would have to be developed with a local community. It would have to be supported by willing partners, however that is defined, and implemented with fidelity to the IPVI and subject to rigorous monitoring and evaluation. So something to just kind of say on the implementa implemented with fidelity to the IPVI. So many people watching may kind of go, oh, well, we're already doing this in New South Wales or Queensland. And certainly there are high risk targeting teams in multiple jurisdictions now, which take a very similar approach to focus deterrence in terms of identifying who is highest risk for reoffending and also serious reoffending and throwing policing resources at it. However, focus deterrence is different to just high risk targeting teams. It has many unique dimensions that high risk targeting teams do not have. It's so it's things like the community messaging. It's about the graduated model of delivery. It's the very structured approach to um, the allocation of intervention and resources to particular victims and offenders at a particular point in time. So when I say implemented with fidelity to the IPVI, surely it can build upon what we already know about the efficacy of high risk targeting teams, but it has to be consistent with the model that has been developed in the US because it's only then that we would be able to really determine whether or not this model in particular has relevance to the Australian context. So just some acknowledgements for the people who help us, helped us to get here. So Garner, Clancy, Carlotta and Rachel Teacher. Um, but this is definitely a moving face. This is one innovative response to a very complex problem and it should not be seen to be taking the attention away from any of the other options that are currently being put on the table. But it is certainly something that we think has legs. So thank you very much. <laughs>